Can we just start with the days after SVB collapses? You've raised all this capital. This is like your moment to make things happen. Mm -hmm. How difficult was it to deploy it? Well, I think you had to differentiate between a, a deposit crisis over the first few days, that Thursday and over the weekend when the government took its action, uh, and then you really were talking to a lot of borrowers and a, a, lot, a lot of institutions that needed you know, help. So uh, that week we did a very large transaction and helped out PacWest. Um, but I, I think what you're really talking about this morning here is a deposit crisis evolving into a business model question. And that's really where the overall uh, uh, evolution of the markets are. But certainly, you know, we, we've been very busy. We've been very busy on all sides of our business. And there's no doubt that this withdrawal of capital, it's not a credit crunch. Uh, it's not an ebullient market, but there's a transition with a higher cost of capital in debt financing across all the markets. Let's dig deeper into that. Can you describe the spaces right now where you expect traditional banks to retrench from, sure. to move away, to move back from, and where you think there's opportunities for you to step in even more? Sure. You know, as we've had this conversation about private credit over the last several years, last decade, it's really been, for the headlines, focused on sponsor finance, which is non-investment grade. The real opportunity opportunity is the is the regional bank model really evolves and their cost of financing is up quite a bit higher there's a variety of asset based strategies whether it's in the commercial mortgage space whether it's in the resi mortgage space whether it's in solar finance whether it's in aircraft finance where the regional banks or traditional banking models those were interesting businesses the business that we bought out of credit swiss the atlas finance business which is really an abs warehouse businesses those those businesses typically the underlying risk is investment grade and and for the most part because of either solvency too in Europe or other rules those are just become much more capital intensive and capital consuming for the banks and so there's a variety of those 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 asset classes that I mentioned that's like 40 trillion well, versus a, a 10 trillion private credit opportunity in the US. But Jim, what I didn't hear you mention was just a pure unsecured revolving loan of credit, sure. which is basically what a lot of these smaller and regional banks delivered to smaller companies. Yep. Is that a no-go area at this point? No, I, I think, listen, th those, are, those are smaller idiosyncratic corporate loans and someone needs to fill the gap in that. And the reality is the cost of financing has gone up two to 400 basis points in the last month. So those companies are getting that financing. Uh, you've not seen it yet in the earnings, but certainly that's where we believe this, this whole idea of tighter financial conditions, it's that exact company that you're talking about that's probably having a more challenging period of time right now securing that financing. How does that change the equation for you when you decide what size company you want to invest in? The bigger, more stable, better access to financing, yeah. going to have perhaps an even better profile yeah versus an even worse one for some of the smaller ones. Sure. T typically, typically at Apollo, um, if the capital's coming from our balance sheet, we're usually talking to companies with companies <laughs> and, and having, having EBITDA less, more than $50 million. That being said, we have a portfolio of 16 portfolio finance companies, of which the CS business, now called Atlas, is one of them. And they'll range in the, in the companies that they finance, that, that's 3,000 employees, about 80 billion of assets. Those companies will lend to companies anywhere from 10 to 15 million in revenue. So much smaller, much deeper and broader. But are they as attractive? Well, what you've seen really across the board, let's go, let's just talk about commercial real estate. A lot of conversations about that. Commercial real estate finance, for the most part, like a single A CMBS piece of paper, that was 350 when I came on here six months ago. That's 675 today. It's just math. Spreads have widened from 175 to 350 over. Yeah, I noticed in Washington today, Brookfield giving back two properties they can't make a go of. Well, I mean, the commercial real estate thing is tangible. I want to look at the level of the word, the D word, distress, that's out there right now. And I look at it just in a basic accounting standard. How blind are people like you right now off FASB 157 and you can't mark the market debt that's out there now? What's the opacity that's out there in the system? Well, I think, I think Tom, if you look at the overall level, 
leveraged finance markets, a couple trillion dollar market. You got to assume defaults next year are probably going up to the mid high fours to five percent. Right. So that's about a hundred billion of of, of uh, challenge credit, if you would, in the forward calendar. If you look at commercial real estate, you got a trillion and a quarter that needs to get financed in the next twelve to eighteen months. So well, there's no doubt that there's a, a portion of that will. But you're not you're not seeing broad distressed yet. You're in this you're in the transition period. We had fourteen years of low interest rates and the real impact on valuations it takes a while right. to filter through you're seeing some evidence in the secondary markets in the PE secondary <clears throat> market though those names are trading between the high 70s and low right. 80s credit secondaries are in the high 80s low 90s VC secondaries in the 50s so you're seeing it in some markets but this idea of tighter financial conditions this takes three six twelve months to really evolve right. and as you talk later on today you know you have your big banks reporting today it will be very interesting to see you know on the regional banks they went from a deposit crisis to a question of their economic business model how do they make money long term and you know the other side of that is we feel that our business model has only gotten enhanced we have long-term liabilities and now those 10-year liabilities in our business it allows us to be a robust stable lender in a period right now of flux and, and conversation the heart of the math to me and and I, the Brookfield article from Bloomberg today is just definitive at the very bottom of it in the last paragraph year over year the monthly payments on a blended piece to sub properties went from 330 gazillion out to 880. And the translation of this to me for all of our listeners and viewers is in the new math, somebody's got to put up cash to do the restructure. It, this it, is a whole new world for a lot of people, Jim. It, it's called cost of cap. cap for, for a decade plus, and I mentioned it to you all before, Equity was the great beneficiary of low-cost debt that really subsidized the equity returns. Exactly. Now we've had a complete paradigm shift, and the, the, it's just math. You said it earlier. The funding costs, when you hear that there's a credit card out there you're making 4% on right now, or a, a, excuse me, not a credit card, but a, uh, a bank deposit program, that's just a cost of goods sold. And it's a it's a higher cost for somebody. The consumer's the great beneficiary, but you know b back to our model, we are looked at. You know the, the the American economy. We've gone through a really tough quarter, but you know four percent of the population, fifty percent of the financial assets in the world. We we have the envy financial markets of the world, and this is in, this is we we're evolving right now in a period of, you know three to nine months, but uh, with a higher cost of capital. That's just flooding through the system. You're in a great spot. That's what you're describing. Is that because of the way the cycle is evolving, or is it more structural in nature? Because it sounds a little bit more like the latter it, 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 the It's secular. It, it's secular. We, you know, if you take the last, as we talked before, if you take the last 25, 30 years and the evolving role of financial services around the globe, really led in the U.S., but following on in Europe and a little bit in Asia as well, you know, there's no doubt that that folks that that are able to be able to operate with the ability that we are to really bring the, the proper liabilities to the equation. You know, our investors are sovereign institutions, uh, pension funds from around the globe. They're the ones that can make the five and ten year commitments uh, along with retirement savers. Those are the folks that should be making these loans. I mean, the digital world has really changed the banking market, and there's a lot of folks that are a lot more knowledgeable about the, the traditional banking system. But again, we, we just have a lot more tools in our toolbox. We're able to provide a lot more capital. As I mentioned, the PacWest solution, that happened basically in three days, a billion for facility for them that really got them through a pretty tough liquidity situation. Uh, but it was a high quality assets that were looked through investment grade. And if you do that, you know, having those solutions, you're, you're doorbell is going to ring quite a bit these days. How much cash do you have in anticipation of the doorbell ringing? You know, I think our latest numbers uh, as of last quarter are probably in, in excess of $50 billion of dry powder. Oh, so um, they could buy Chelsea. Well, you know, I'll, 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 leave it to you. Chelsea. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to talk about that. But, but there's no doubt that investors from around the globe, I, I was in Asia last week, and the idea of really exporting yield around yeah. the globe, um, you know, they, they've had very low rates for a decade plus. Obviously, a lot of conversation about what's going on in, in Japan right now with YCC yield curve control and how do they transition off that. I mean, I think that's a really interesting story for the latter half of the year. But the reality is we're, we're in an evolving market in the States. What was a deposit liquidity crisis is now a evolution of their business model. And really, it's, it's going to be a period of tougher financial conditions. Let's you know, finish on this. Yeah. You describe a process. 
you're expecting tougher financial conditions. I just want to build on the question Lisa asked. I hate to ask the one question. When do you expect that doorbell just to be nonstop ringing? Because that's what it sounds like you're looking yeah, for. I, I, I don't. Th I think by the time that actually happens, all the activities occurred. Uh, I think it's almost too late, Jonathan. I, th I think you really need to be in the markets every single day. The reality is, you know, there were some headlines last week that private credit took a step back because of one financing. The reality is, well, the M and A market's a little bit quieter right now, and you know, LP hey, firms hey, want to do. Jim, things. I got to make some news this morning. I'm looking for a Western Alliance transaction. Would you like to break that news here this morning? I, I, I'll let others talk. About about that okay. one. I, I got I got my hands yeah. full.